Well, yesterday uh, was 75 years since the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. On this program, we have looked at all sorts of conspiracy theories or actual evidence, in fact, that uh, the uh, bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima by the United States Air Force uh, in July 1940, or was it August, actually, I think it was, uh, 1945, uh, were uh, yeah the beginning of August were in fact including some uranium which had been uh, gotten from the Nazi uranium enrichment program. Anyway, that's a fascinating tale in itself, but in a way peripheral because Martin, we're looking now at the uh, expansion of nuclear weapons. Uh, the all countries, China, Russia. Uh, possibly even the Israelis, but certainly the US and the NATO countries that have nuclear weapons, like France, for example, are upgrading their nuclear weapons. And in the background, we've got uh, bubbling along, haven't we, the uh, increase in nuclear power, nuclear energy, with the Chinese and the French building a nuclear power station uh, called Hinkley C. W- what do you make of the way this is all going? Because, you know, for example, after Fukushima, the Germans cancelled their nuclear program completely. They said this is a completely crazy technology, effectively. It's not, it's far too expensive. Uh, we're going to get rid of it completely after Fukushima. Uh, so, what do you make of the way this is all going? It seems now that it, we're, we're supposed to be expanding. There's even a new China only station. Uh, nuclear power station they're applying for in Bradwell, which has been closed for some years uh, down in Suffolk as well. Well, I mean, you've got to make some distinction between military nukes and civilian nukes. I mean, there's obviously a massive amount of overlap. I mean, civilian nuclear energy basically only developed as a cover for military uh, for military uh, uses. So, so, for example, so the, the Indians so the, developed the, their Iran, nuclear Iran is planning to Canadian nuclear weapons. Reactors. Is Iran planning to build a nuclear weapon? No, I don't think they are, because there's no strategic purpose to it. Even if they had one, it wouldn't, it wouldn't help them. That what they're doing is they are preparing to fight, but they don't, and they've actually admit uh, that the top, uh, the top uh, religious leadership has said that nuclear weapons are un-Islamic. They've issued fatwas against them. They've always maintained that what they want is civilian nuclear power. And, of course, all the huffing and puffing, the Israelis have not signed the non-proliferation treaty. The Iranians have, and they've ex- accepted all sorts of inspections. Uh, the Israelis won't sign the treaty because um, they've got loads of nuclear weapons and they don't want, uh, they're not going to give them up. And, of course, the, the Logan Act in the U.S. says that any country that develops nuclear weapons unofficially should have complete sanctions on them, which is why the Israelis never admit openly that they've got these nuclear weapons, although we know they have them because of Mordecai the Nunu's revelations some years ago. Um, and you know, the danger of any, uh, you know, there's so many things to go wrong here, isn't there? Leaving aside the fact that the waste from these uh, nuclear power plants is going to be a problem for generations and generations to come. It's only it's only made to seem viable as long as the waste is 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 magic. Well, that's the right. Equation. The waste will go along with the debt, won't it? Uh, that will also. But anyway, I thought we'd have a, uh, a chat with um, Dr. Chris Busby, who's been a major figure around the UK in uh, helping people who have been, for example, living near nuclear power stations who have caught uh, the the, the disease leukaemia, particularly childhood leukaemia clusters. Um, And uh, so on Hiroshima Day, uh, that that is to say 75 years after the exploding of the first atomic bomb, let's have a listen to uh, what Chris Busby has to say, uh, but particularly about the way that we now measure uh, whether or not nuclear power stations are safe. I'm Chris Busby. I, I, I was trained as a chemical physicist um, and I worked for a drug company, Welcome, for some years. And, uh, I, and since 90, about 1990, I've been engaged in researching and, and de- de- you know, developing new ideas about the health effects of internal radiation. I'm the, I, I formed the European Committee on Radiation Risk with the support of the Green Party in 1998. And since then, I've been on two British government committees looking at the health effects of internal radiation. I've now published more than 50 papers in the scientific peer review literature on the effects of radiation. And I'm particularly interested in uranium because I think uranium is, 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 an iso- is a substance which, is, which has been wildly underestimated in terms of its effects 
uh, which emerged originally in, in depleted uranium uh, weapons use in the Gulf Wars. OK, so, uh, I mean, my own experience, if I can call it that, of uh, nuclear material is standing on Temple Mead Station as one of these uh, trains with nuclear flasks was heading through. And uh, I was actually waiting for another train. But, I, I, I mean, it may have been my imagination. I don't think it was. But I could feel the radiation coming off of these things. I think the idea is that uh, at Hinkley Power Station... Uh, the uh, these uh, uranium fuel rods they get extremely radioactive in the reactor mm -hmm. and then they have to put them in a cooling pond to cool down for a year or so then stick them on a train and send them to Sellafield but I I actually f could feel it almost in my you know, in my bones I could feel this kind of a nasty sensation coming off of this train so I back backed off and went round the corner on Temple Mead Station to get away from it. So the, the question now, anyway, is that what is going on with the nuclear program in the UK, Chris? Because we are starting to see a kind of new green movement that is embracing nuclear power because of its uh, effects uh, less apparently on the climate. Yes. Well, of course, this is a decision people have to make on, on the basis of, of their ideas about whether nuclear is carbon dioxide free and whether 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 it should be used in order to to have a low carbon footprint with regard to climate change uh, and so a lot of the green greenies have now decided that that climate change is a much bigger threat than than the radiation that's likely to come from the nuclear industry and of course they're entitled to do that but they should do it on the basis of of the real truth about the health effects of releases from these nuclear sites rather than some you know pie in the sky nonsense that's peddled by the nuclear industry and and also then parroted by people like George Monbiot you know who actually knows nothing at all about radiation or radiation biology or radiation risk or anything I mean he's just a, he's just and also other there's another guy Mark something or another who who embraces nuclear on the basis of, of totally crazy ideas about the way about, about the the risks from it. Now, I ha I'll say a few things about the risks from it because that's something that I've studied quite a lot and published quite a lot about. And and those risks were originally studied by um, the Atomic Bomb Casualty Committee, who followed the people who were exposed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki for their lifespan. It's called the lifespan study. So anyway, the point is that the risk model, what emerges from this is that the risk model that they obtained from doing that, that big study is completely wrong. It's just totally and completely wrong by, by orders of magnitude, by, by factors of between 1,000 and 10,000, which is why when you go and study people living near nuclear sites like Hinckley and Bradwell, which I have studied you know, and, and published in the peer review literature, you find excess risk of cancer, particularly female breast cancer, also, I looked at Tras Venice nuclear power station in Wales. Again, we had a five-fold excess of breast cancer in women. But what, uh, and then you, you find that there are excess risks of childhood leukemia in just about every single nuclear site that anybody has studied. But, but they continue to deny causation on the basis of this, this Hiroshima study. Okay, so what would you say, um, you know, how do you, would you counter those arguments? What evidence have you got that this study is so wrong? Well, the, the Hiroshima study um, it, it is 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 based on or was based. It started in 1952. I mean, you have to. It was an epidemiological study of about 80,000 people who were exposed at the time of the bomb, and they were originally com to be compared with a control group, people who weren't in the city at the time of the bomb, in order to see how many cancers there were. And then to see how many cancers there were on the basis of what dose they got from the immediate explosion. Um, and so this, 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 this study carried on. It was funded by the Americans. The first thing you could say about it, which is what Alice Stewart said, is that it was a survivor population. So by 1952, when they assembled all these people, an awful lot of people who'd been exposed to the radiation had died. But anyway, putting that to one side... You can then you can then look at these people and see how many cancers they got according to how far they were from the explosion. Now, the the, the explosion produces gamma rays and neutrons, external radiation, and that's absorbed by the people's bodies that live there. And if they're really close to it when it went off, they were just incinerated. Then, if they're about a you know 500 meters a kilometer away, some of them survived and then went on to get cancer. 
But after two kilometers, nobody got any dose at all because that's that's when it, when the the radiation runs out of steam. Um, so so what the what the study did is it looked at the dose according to their distance from when the bomb went off, and it compared that to the number of cancers they got. But in 1970, by 1973, suddenly they discovered that the people who were not in the city, you know, the control group, started to, to show up with lots of cancers. And they said, well, this is impossible. I mean, they weren't even exposed to the radiation. So they kicked out the control group. They said, this must be a false control group. So they took it out altogether. And after that, they just compared high dose to medium dose to low dose. And they drew a straight line through the whole thing. And that gave them the number of cancers you get per unit dose. But there was a huge problem. And the problem was that that bomb, when it exploded, sucked an awful lot of water vapor up into the air. And then the bomb constituents themselves, the uranium that the bomb was made of, and 95% of it hadn't fissioned, it was only 5% that fissioned, um, turned into particles. And that those particles fell on the ground as black rain. And this black rain fell for at least seven or eight kilometers away from the bomb, from, from the detonation. So in, the, in, the, in around about 2000, 2005, so that, that sort of time, people, the stud, the studies began to show that people who were nowhere near the bomb were getting cancer. Okay? The control group people had got high levels of cancer. They weren't even in the city. They just came in afterwards. So obviously those people were exposed to something that were giving them cancer. And this something was the black rain. Well, secret documents that, that I saw when I was doing the court case, and I'm not allowed to talk about it apart from saying that, you know, I, I, uh, the, the, the fact that those documents exist are there in the transcripts of the court case, which are public data. Um, they, they, can be, they, they, they can be taken forward to, uh, to, um, to show that the concentration of uranium inside the bomb um, in the black rain was extremely high, that the doses from the black rain were extremely high. And the reason I can say this is that in 2014, an American document from Rocky Flats, where they, where they processed this uranium into the bomb material, was released for public consumption in 2014. It was a 1976 document. And when you look at it, you can see that the amounts of, uh, the, uh, of a missing uranium isotope called uranium-234 were absolutely enormous. They were absolutely enormous. So what happened is that, that the, the study, the Hiroshima study, is, is made false, made completely false by the fact that the cancers were not caused by the external radiation. They were caused by the exposure to internal uranium particles from the black rain, which were, which were in the water supply and in the dust when people were rebuilding the city from 1945 to 1950. There was huge amounts of dust because they were like, you know, pulling, pulling all the ruins down and rebuilding it and so on. And everyone is inhaling the dust. Uh, or, or drinking the water contaminated contaminated with this U two three four, so this is this is big news because what this means is that the risk model that they they obtained from this Hiroshima study is completely wrong. Now that's the same risk model that's used to argue that cancers near Hinkley Point and cancers near Bradwell. I found high levels of breast cancer near Bradwell also, and that's been published in the literature. Those cancers are real, and they're caused by the radiation. They're caused by the uranium released from the stacks and other isotopes released from the stacks of the nuclear power stations well, into no, the look, local I'm environment. Sure nuclear fuels, Chris, would say that actually they don't release any uranium from the stacks, that it's all filtered out. Yes, well, they do say that, but actually there are papers that, sh that show that that just isn't true. And in fact, there was a, the, 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 the data that they brought out for when, when EDF were, building Hink Hill, were, were applying for the license to build Hinkley Point, there was an environmental impact assessment made in which the concentrations of uranium were actually measured uh, in the soil around the site, you know, as a sort of background to what was going, going to happen when they bring, bring in the new reactor. And we analysed, I did with Cecily Collingridge and I, she's dead now, but we, we analysed that data and we found that there was a huge number of tonnes of, of extra uranium in the soil around Hinkley, around the site that they were, you know, around the Hinkley Point site. And that uranium was in the upper soil, so it wasn't in the lower soil, because they, they actually did cause. So we could show that the upper soil contained a lot more uranium than the lower soil. And this uranium had been coming from the stacks 
it, it, and also from being pumped out into the sea where it gets washed back. So we also had a trend with distance from the sea. So all that uranium is in the mud. And not only that, but we actually took samples and measured the uranium. And, the, and the, there is uranium also in the, in, the spec, in the spectra that we obtain by Freedom of Information Act requests to, to the operators of Hinkley Point. I think maybe even to EDF, I can't remember. I know Environment Agency, that was it. So we got the data and we could show that there was excess uranium in the mud. Now that mud is being dredged now and taken over to the to the uh, Welsh side and just dumped off Cardiff, where you've got millions of people living just near all that stuff. Well, it's- yeah, but you see, uh, British Nuclear Fuels, the operators of these plants, will say there is no uh, uranium in the local environment. They'll say, actually, that uranium, Chris, stays in the reactor itself on, and it just heats water up. It doesn't go anywhere. It certainly doesn't go into the atmosphere. Well, that just isn't true. I mean, if you look at the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, the 2000 edition is the last time that they start, start, that they released data on the releases, their tables from 1990 to, to, to 1999. So that's nine or ten years of data from every nuclear site in the world. And, and, and one, of the, one of the tables, you know, one of the rows in those tables... Is, has has Hinkley has the Hinkley reactors Hinkley A Hinkley B so they are you know I mean anybody can see so that. How does it get? How does the uranium get through uh, a, a great big steel pressure vessel? I mean, it can't just go through metal, can it? No, of course not. They, but the, the thing is that they 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 vent this stuff through stacks. They vent the cooling water through stacks, and the cooling water gets contaminated by. Um, leakages and, and broken up fuel rods and all sorts of crap, you know. I mean, it just is the case. You, you can see in the tables that they that they, they say particulate releases, and these particulate releases are releases of particles of uranium from the fuel rods, and they go out, they, they, they are released every year uh, in, in, into, the, into, the, into the air. I mean, there they are in the tables. There's quite a lot of it, I can tell you. I mean, I can, you know, I can send you the tables and you can see them. There, there they are. So, I mean, they could say, oh, it can't come out of here because it's impossible. But whether it's impossible or not, it does. OK, so the latest news we've got from Hinkley is that there has been a, a tower that has collapsed uh, at Hinkley, which released a dust cloud in the whole area. A spokesperson for EDF, which is building the site, said the silos st- suffered structural damage. Um, and this was uh, just uh, back on the 10th of June. Uh, it doesn't sound as if the people constructing it are really doing a very good job if they've allowed an, a large silo to collapse on site. Well, there's another thing. That, yes, I agree with you. And there's another thing. They're the turbines. I mean, the, these things have oil seals. You know, they, 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 you've got, in order to drive the electricity through the turbines, you've got to have a shaft which runs through, through metal. And on one side of it, you get all the steam and all the stuff. And on the other side, you get, you know, you, 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 you get the air. And the, the oil for, for those things is, is incinerated regularly. They have incinerators. They just burn it. So there are lots of ways in which this stuff can get out. I mean, there's the cooling ponds as well, you know. So these things get thrown into the cooling ponds that, that you know, it like like to cool off, you know. And then 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 of course they go off to try to um, Sellafield to be re- whatever they do there, you know, to re- recycled or or turned into plutonium or whatever, you know, re- reprocessed. That was it. And it gets out of Sellafield, I can tell you, because we've measured it. I mean, I've measured. I tell you one thing that I did recently. Which 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 hasn't hasn't got out, is that I got an air filter from somebody living in 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 uh, just just within five six kilometres of I think maybe Covington somewhere like that uh, from a vehicle. I asked them. I, I've been asking for vehicle air filters in order to see particles inside them if there are any, because there's a method of looking at particles called CR thirty nine. It's a bit like a photographic method. So you put you put it next to the um, to the air filter uh, membrane, and you leave it for a long time, and then you get these little tracks that you can see when you develop it with, with with potassium hydroxide, and you can look at it through a microscope. So there was this filter that was sent to me by this person who lived near Hinkley Point, and there it is. There's there's a uranium part, a really seriously dangerous uranium particle in the car air filter. So if it can get into an engine air filter, it can certainly get into your lung. 
It certainly can, yes. So are you encouraging people who live around Hinkley and other nuclear power stations to send you their car air, fil air filters when they get replaced? At, at no, the I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't done more than that one. I mean, it's quite a tedious business doing this. So you have to develop it because the uranium is quite a weak, a weak alpha emitter. You have to develop it for about 30 days. And I'm the, I, I was mostly interested in in these particles near Sellafield. So I've got a lot of car, I've got a lot of car air, air filters from up Barrow in Furness up to West, uh, Whitehaven, and also soil samples. And I've been I've been looking at those to look at the um, the, the the particles in in those. In fact, in fact, that may have been partly why the police raided this place, you know, because they, they were very interested in all the radiation experiments that were going on. In fact, they destroyed one of the radiation experiments. We, I had a part, I had a f air filter with, um, with one of these CR39 things on it and they, they picked it up and, and basically that just destroyed the link between the two, you know, so I was a bit irritated by that. OK, what would you say then to uh, environmentally minded Green Party types that actually are now embracing nuclear, Chris? I, I, I'll say this, that, that as a result of nuclear power station releases and, nu and, test, and, and nuclear tests in the atmosphere, more than 60 million people have died of cancer between 1952 and 1990. And I haven't updated it after that. The, the 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 cancer effects from the exposure to internal radiation are absolutely terrifying, and they've they've caused increases uh, uh, in infertility, and they've they've basically destroyed destroyed the the biological genome, not just of human beings but of animals and 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 plants and the whole works. And there's just such a lot of evidence that this is the case that's completely ignored. This evidence is in the peer review literature. It's possible to do experiments that show it, but but the 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 trouble is with these people they're not scientists like Monbiot they're they're not they're not remotely scientists and they just swallow the guff that's handed by by the nuclear industry and they say, um, well this is science. I mean the the problem is it's about who you believe you know it's, it's like like it, Pilot um... saying what is truth. It's interesting that uh, George Monbiot in The Guardian came out as pro-nuclear as an environmentalist uh, around about the time of the Fukushima disaster. Is that the case? Yes, that's right. I mean, I, 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 was, I've been contact, I was contacted by Monbiot uh, not long before that, about, about a year before that, when I was pally with Michael Meacher. And Monbiot phoned me up when I was in the south of France and he asked me to send him an outline of how radiation causes, because at that time he was anti-nuclear. And because he said he was going to write an article in the, in the Guardian about radiation. This was before he came out in favor, before Fukushima. But in the end, he didn't use any of the stuff that I that I sent him. And at that time, I, I thought, well, hang on, what's going on here? And then what happened was Fukushima. Then I got a very high profile because I was the first person to go out on the television. As luck would have it, I was passing through London from France at the time. And they hauled me into the studio, the BBC. You can still see that one on YouTube. And I said, look, and they were saying, oh, this is not a big deal. You know, it's not as bad as Three Mile Island and you know, no releases and blah, blah. And I said, look, this is extremely serious and it's worse than Chernobyl. And so then the, what happened was that I was invited out to Japan by some Japanese lawyers to, to give evidence in a court case about taking the children away from the contaminated zone. And I got quite a big sort of, pro, you know, big media presence in, in, in Japan. I was on all the TV shows and all the rest of it. And I was generally, you know, fated as a great, a great sort of scientist and so forth. And so, of course, somebody had to bring me down. And that, and, and that somebody was Monbiot. So at that point, Monbiot, who I've always believed is a dodgy character and who works for the, for, you know, for, for the bad guys, he was obviously triggered at that point. You know, they thought, well, we've got to do something here because, well, because it looked like Fukushima was going to be the end of the nuclear industry. So they had to sort of get the greenies on board. They had to somehow get the greenies on board. So they played the they, they played the card of the you know the, the the global warming card with Monbiot because Monbiot had a big following because because somehow he, or another he'd managed to get himself into the Guardian as like their main correspondent on the environment. So he had a he had a lot of weight behind him, and so he 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 wrote all that nasty stuff about me. And that, that completely destroyed my um, my funding base with the Roundtree Foundation and so on. You know, so after that, no, none of the greeny people, green, greeny foundations, have given me a penny. But in fact, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I think Monbiot shot himself in the foot there because an awful lot of people 
were quite angry about what he did. And uh, in the end, he, he wasn't able to justify it. I mean, he was asked to appear at, at Oxford Town Hall in a debate with me about the issue, and he refused to come, so he chickened out. Uh, what about uh, Hinckley then? Uh, I mean, uh, there has been some reigning back of nuclear. Obviously, the Germans have done it post Fukushima. Yes. Uh, uh, well, my own, my own feeling is that it's not going to happen. I mean, I, and, and to come back to the political side of it, I mean, if it's if we do live in a democracy, which actually, you know, we can argue about, um, then it, it is a d democratic decision. So if people all vote for nuclear, you know, just like they all voted for Brexit, Brexit, then we can say that that's the democratic decision. But but the point about democracy, it has to work, you know, for it to work properly, it has to work on the basis of the of real data, real information. And it's not. I mean, there's there's just a pack of lies being being disseminated about the health effects of radiation. Um, and and so that's that's completely wrong. But I, I personally think that the money will get them. I mean, at the moment, I think they're, they're, they are, they're talking about building all these power stations just in order to raise money, frankly. I don't think they'll ever build any of them. Uh, what about, OK, so what about uh, the alternative types of energy? Like, for example, right next to Hinkley, there is uh, the Bristol Channel, which has one of the uh, highest tidal reaches in the world. Um, which is it, w the distance between the high and low tides. Uh, do you think there's any possibility that uh, what we'll see instead built there is, is some sort of tidal energy system? Well, it could be done. Um, absolutely could be done. Of course, the problem is if the sea level rises, then, then, then you, know, it's not, it's, you know, it's hard to see how they could do it. Um, and, of course, everybody will come out and say, oh, we can't have this because it will affect the wildlife and this and that. But, I mean, I think it's a good idea myself. I mean, the real answer, I'm always getting asked this question, like, what to do, is is we just cannot continue to use the level of energy that we're using because most of that energy is used to make things which are unnecessary and, and, and wasteful. Uh, it's it's an economic problem, really. I mean, we with, with, with all the scientific developments there are, we can do most of the things we need to do really quite cheaply. You know, I mean, if you had proper transport systems like, like we do in Latvia, you know, you don't need a car in Latvia because, you know, you've got fantastic, fantastic um, transport systems. You've got buses that go everywhere for next to nothing. And you could do that in England, but, but they don't. Because in England, they're, they're interested in selling lots of cars and making money for the, for the people who make the cars and so forth. And all, most of the things that you can buy in the shops are unnecessary the pandemic i wonder because we spoke to you right at the very start actually uh when it all started kicking off over in china yeah. and saying things like oh well you don't think masks uh, may be uh, all that useful but you, you know you came up with all sorts of interesting stuff uh saying for example um that, that the link to 5g was likely to be very spurious and possibly complete nonsense which yes. it does seem to have been the case yeah. how do you think it's all transpired and i wonder are you going around with your mask in the shops do you, well, where do you think I, yeah, the I, cer I certainly am i mean I, I i tell you what i've just come from latvia to pick up my my uh, 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 uh what do you call my stepdaughter i suppose to take her back to latvia um and I, I'm treating this this country like like it's Mars, you know. So I go along with gloves on and, and a hat and, and a mask and the whole works, you know. I mean, because this is right. This is a serious. I said right at the beginning that this was very serious, you know. I, I and, and people say, oh no, it's just a load of scam, and it's just the you know the people are trying to make out it so that they can control us and this and that. This is a serious, serious, serious disease, and it's going rumbling. It's rumbling along now. It hasn't stopped. I thought it might go way eventually but it hasn't it's rumbling along a low level and i think it might pick up towards the winter again so i i think people have to be very worried about this and to take and to take all the precautions that the government has belatedly decided to put in place otherwise you know there's going to be a lot more dead people um, and i'm getting out I'm, I'm only here to pick up layla and then i'm getting out and then i'm going to go and live in the middle of nowhere again and hide <laughs> well look Back, back to Hinckley, finally. W what about the, um, I mean, is, is this all the activity that we're seeing near Bridgewater really going to just simply grind to a halt? We're going to be left with these half-built stations. That's what you're implying. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's exactly what will happen. What, what will happen is that the, the, the bad guys who are <coughs> running the show here are going to, going to get the maximum amount of money out of it that they can and then go bankrupt. 
I mean, that's what that's that's the way that's the way of the world now. What you do is you is you have you have some sort of building project. You you see Boris Johnson is saying, oh, we're going to build, build, build. You know, we're going to be build our way out of this desperate recession that's likely to come at us because we're spending so much money because nobody's doing anything because of the coronavirus. So we're going to build. What that means, that doesn't mean build. What that means is we're going to borrow money to build. Okay. And so that's what people do. That's the name of the game. So you set up some bogus company like, like you know, Green Earth Cooperative. And then you get, you get, you get the, the planning people to, and this is already happening. He's opened up the planning all over the place. So you go to the planning people and you say, oh, we're going to build an enormous housing estate for all the poor people in the middle of that field over there. So you buy the field off the farmer for tuppence. And then you go to the banks and you say that this 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 development is going to be worth 29 billion or million. And so the banks give you half of that. And then you, you put a few foundations in and then you go bankrupt and run off of the money. <laughs> that's the way of the world nowadays. That's how money is made. Dr. Chris Busby, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. So that's Dr. Chris Busby there. Um, he's an expert on radiation, effects of radiation, particularly around nuclear power stations. Been involved in many court cases and detected what he believes and what, to a certain extent, the courts have also agreed are... Uh, leukemia clusters around these places and particularly childhood le leukemia um martin what do you think from what you've heard there i mean he's he's in a way i mean he's a fascinating idea isn't it that someone has sent him an air filter from their car to check and he's found uranium in it well i mean you've got to listen to it haven't you um nuclear power clearly isn't safe i mean anybody i mean the, the nuclear power has been developed on the back of uh, nuclear weapons, the the Indian nuclear bombs were de what they did is they bought can do nuclear reactors from Canada, so they were basically peaceful nuclear reactors, but they only bought them so that they could develop uh, nuclear material for bombs, and you know AQ Khan obviously develops uh, the Pakistani bomb uh, on a different basis. Um, people have known ever since Hiroshima and John Hershey's reports that nuclear radiation is just terribly bad for you and it lasts for thousands of years and basically to be avoided um, if you can. One of the interesting things about Chris Busby is he, he pointed to George Monbiot there. They were both members uh, of the Green Party, as I was actually, back uh, in the 1990s. And George Monbiot, when it came to the time of the... Fukushima disaster uh, actually published in The Guardian uh, a hatchet job on Chris Busby. So they had formerly been colleagues, but obviously Chris Busby did not have a, car, a column in The Guardian. And George Monbiot uh, really attacked him, basically saying that, you know, we need nuclear power. Uh, interesting that that happened just after the Fukushima uh, accident, where the nuclear industry was so much in question. Indeed, the German authorities decided to cancel their program completely. Yeah, well, let's let's bring in the Stuxnet virus here, <clears throat> a cyber attack on the Iranian nuclear program, which caused all of their centrifuges to blow out. And the, the, the Israelis and the Americans have basically uh, all but said, yeah, that we did that. Wasn't it brilliant? But of course, it then got into the world's computer systems and may have had a role in what happened at Fukushima. Um, uh, obviously, Fukushima is an absolute disaster. You've got loads of radioactive water being leached into the Pacific. We could mention, if we're doing nuclear topic, uh, the bombings of Bikini Atoll in the 1950s, <clears throat> eventually with hydrogen bombs by the Americans, and huge plumes of radioactive dust uh, were, were, were allowed to flow over the Marshall Islands, and loads of people uh, subsequently were exposed. <clears throat> um, lots of military I mean, people. Also, were there were also, uh, Martin, there were also... For example, whole loads of fishermen that were also exposed, uh, Japanese fishermen. And the, the, uh, there are people who say that th these were actually deliberately not warned of the test to, so that they could be part of the test. Well, you may say so. Uh, they, I mean, the original bombing, they were testing what they were doing. I mean, all the justification for it about, you know, there would have to have been a, a major assault on Japan. Well, that's debatable. Japan was completely surrounded and was under an economic blockade. 
And what was really probably significant is that the Russians had declared war on Japan and they were moving through Manchuria towards Korea and they'd have ended up in Korea. And then if the Americans and the British say, well, we don't want to lose the casualties to invade Japan, the Russians will say, well, we've already taken 20 million. We can take another 2 million, but we're having Japan. And at that point, the bombs are dropped. The Japanese don't want to be taken over by the Russians and the, the Americans come in and with, with, with all the consequences that we know. Uh, I, I, I do think, actually, that going on about they shouldn't, they didn't have to use nuclear weapons. Tokyo had been bombed with conventional explosives not, but not long before, and 100,000 people died. There is no real difference in killing people, but the difference, I suppose, about radioactivity is I'm quite sure it's probably not safe in Hiroshima even today, all these years later, whereas in Tokyo uh, people probably are, even though they were incinerated in 1945. I mean, some people have said, Martin, there was no strategic need, as you say there, to um, use the atomic weapon on Japan, and also that this was a uh, deliberate test on Japanese people on Hiroshima Day 75 years ago that didn't need to take place. Indeed, some have even suggested that uh, the uh, President Roosevelt, who was said to be against the use of uh, the atomic bomb on Japan, uh, died literally just at the end of the war in Europe, uh, a couple of months before the bombs were dropped. Yeah, well, I mean, there's still lots of debate about how the decision was made. Quite a lot of the top brass in the US, uh, Eisenhower, for example, said there was no need for that. And he ultimately became president of the US. Uh, I think the real message was being sent to the Russians. Look what we've got. Don't forget. And and, and also uh, the recklessness. You know, we we're quite prepared. And we know we know that a plan was cooked up by Churchill and others to atomic bomb uh, the Soviet Union's major cities. And they were working on that. So it's probably just as well that the, the, the Soviet the spy network was extremely good. So they knew all about this stuff at, at the Potsdam conference when when Truman said to Stalin, we've got a new weapon, you know. And uh, and he said, oh, well, I hope you use it on the Japanese. And people who were standing around thought well, Stalin doesn't seem to understand what this is. But apparently Stalin knew exactly what it was because he got his own scientists working on exactly that. And of course, lots of his scientists were getting information directly from the people working on the atomic bomb and the Manhattan well, Project, from, from many of whom were communists. From Klaus Fuchs, uh, who did his studying in Bristol, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, on this very topic of whether or not it was a good idea or necessary to use the atom bomb uh, back in August uh, 1945, probably one of the best books on it is by a guy called Gar Alperovitz. That's A-L-P-E-R-O-V-I-T-Z, Gar Alperovitz. Uh, and that's called The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. And that really does include all sorts of interesting angles on those uh, arguments which were used and counter arguments which were put by particularly by politicians in the military and in the United States about whether or not this was going to be necessary. Of course, we know, Martin, that actually uh, if, a, if a weapon has been developed, those that have developed it would rather like to see it used in anger uh, because that gives them an idea of how it might, useful it might be in the future uh, if a, in, a for, in, a, in a subsequent war. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, th there was no re I mean, they basically Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, 67 uh, cities in Japan, including Tokyo, have been reduced to rubble. But these two cities have been left so that they could be atomic bombed with no, with no other damage to them so that they could then see exactly what the damage was when you just use an atomic bomb with nothing else involved. So um, don't forget that many of the people who developed the atomic bomb were profoundly anti-Nazi uh, people, and they, they developed it because they feared that, that Hitler would get, get it. Uh, but once Hitler had been defeated, uh, they were not happy at all about it being used on Japan. Um, um, but as you know, re realpolitik doesn't work like that. What do you make of uh, the uh, research that I've been doing and others have been doing on the uh, Nazi uh, enriched uranium programme? Because it, certainly with the rests in... Uh, in Germany of people who are in possession of nuclear material that they won't tell the authorities where they found it. We've also had the German government actually itself coming out and saying there was 
uh, a nuclear uh, enrichment program, which they previously had denied. Uh, and then, of course, then there's the um, testimony of various people involved in this submarine, U-234. Funnily enough, we just heard about an isotope of uranium called U-234. This is a German submarine called U-234, uh, which was heading across the Atlantic, containing allegedly uh, large amounts of enriched uranium and also the fuses necessary, the infrared fuses necessary for the plutonium bomb. Uh, so there is some evidence for for there being a, a German nuclear program, which deliberately wasn't used in order to make it a bargaining chip with the Allies at the end of the war. I think that's a very interesting thesis. And as you know, uh, deals were being done at the end of the war with senior Nazi figures, not Hitler. Nobody told him anything. And it's quite possible that some of the material that was dropped on Japan have been developed in the Nazi nuclear program and given to the Western powers as part of a deal uh, to, uh, you know, Bormann, as we know, ended up in Argentina and, and continued to operate. Well, it's to allow under, safe under passage, the cover of Western a, lot these, services. a lot of these war criminals were very concerned about what was going to happen to them at the end of the war. They needed to buy their safe passage at the end, didn't they? Yeah. So the, it, 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 there's a lot of evidence to suggest that sort of thing went on. Uh, and when, when, when the Allies took over in Japan, the Kempotai and the, and the power structure, they'd carried out loads of biological and chemical warfare experiments on lots of different people. And they said, well, if you want this material, you're going to have to let us off. And if you let us off, we'll give it you all. And that was the deal that was done. And the, the, we're going to move on now, I think, not to talk about biological warfare labs, but, I mean, the, the, the Western biological warfare and chemical warfare program came from that era and, um, and, it's, and, and it's still continuing. 